This time I'm going to be working on how to mount the spindle encoder to my lathe. Welcome to another episode. This is the second part uh, of a multi-part series on converting my lathe to use an electronic lead screw for both the lead screw, which is the uh, z-axis, as well as the the x-axis, which is the cross slide. Uh, in this episode, as I mentioned, I'm going to be focusing on how to mount the encoder to the back of the machine. I had hoped that I would have that mount finished and I could have it hooked up to the machine and then move on to the lead screw. But as you'll find out, things didn't quite go the way I hoped they would go. Let's get started. What I want to do is, is take off probably I'll probably only have to take off this gear so that I can start to get in here and measure the banjo and a few other things. So I'll pull out a wrench um, to be able to loosen that and then it just comes off the end. So that's pretty simple. And then what I want to do is start taking some measurements and um, it's a little hard to get my calipers in there so I think I'll just use a, a rule to to get rough measurements. So if I look in here, and so that's looking like about 1.05 inches. I don't have a, a metric rule. That would make it a lot easier. And then what I'm going to do over here is, is start uh, drawing a picture of uh, what this looks like. And I'm not going to draw the entire picture because I don't really need that. But I'm going to put in the dimensions that uh, are important. So I said this is about 1.05 inches right there and then I'm going to measure the, the slot here. Yeah, it's about 0.35 inches wide and it's a, a T-slot um, so I want to measure how deep the slot is. And for the depth, looks like about 0.55. Okay, so that gives me a good idea of how to model uh, this banjo. And then the other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to measure roughly how far it is to the, the pivot point, which looks like about 4 inches. And I don't know if I really need that. I'm just putting it in, in here in case I do. And then I'm going to try to, to get a rough idea. You can tell this is not rocket science here. Um, or precision engineering or anything like that. So this is about uh, three and a quarter inches. And then if I look at this distance here, it's about two and three quarters. Then I want to look at how much space I have in here. What I'm noticing, let me uh, flip this up, is when it's up here, it has a lot less space because uh, the back is not even. So if we look here, I'm going to call that uh, 0.05 inches. Uh, to the back. Um, so the the total distance from the back to the front I think is about two inches. What I'm going to do is I'm going to back out this screw. This is, I'm going to use a very unscientific method and I'm going to close the door until I feel it hit. And then I'm going to measure. Okay, so that means that it hit. I'm going to put it in just a little bit. Okay, still feels like it's hitting slightly. Okay, so um, I'm going to call that good. So what I'm going to do is measure this right here. Okay, so that's about uh, 0 0.3. I'll, I'll be conservative and call it 0.3 inches. So basically if we have um, the, the pulley and then we have um, 
the little uh, washer, and then we have the bolt, and then we have the door. Uh, the difference between the spacer and the door is about 0 0.3 inches. So that's the maximum we can go out in this direction. And then if I measure the distance from the inside here, uh, where the gear is, to the back, it's about one inch. Okay, so I'm going to take these dimensions that I have now and then uh, go to the computer, start modeling something up. I'm going to 3D print uh, the other pulley and then I'm going to 3D print various ways of mounting things until I have something that I'm pretty happy with and looks like it will work. Uh, and I can do this while I wait for the, the pulleys to arrive in the mail. So the idea is to fit this encoder in here somewhere. And let me uh, put this back down. One of the things you'll notice is that it's a, a pretty tight fit in here. So um, if we take the pulley, you can see that uh, right here it's probably going to be hitting. And so one of the things I realized is that I probably need to rotate this up like so, which will give me more clearance, as you can see there, so that uh, there will be room for the pulley to fit in here and everything else. It's, it's a very tight fit. I use the dimensions, or the rough dimensions, I should say, to model the banjo, and this is not an accurate model. It doesn't need to be accurate. The important dimensions are the cross-section of the T-slot here, and also the distance from this face to the center here. I also have the relationship between this pivot point and the pulley that I've modeled so far. This is the encoder that I'm planning to use uh, that I showed you last time. And it may be hard to see, let me turn it this way. Uh, there are letters here and they read uh, from top to bottom it says B, 5 volts, A, X, and G. So 5 volts is the input that uh, is used to drive the circuit that's behind here. And then G is ground. A and B are the two quadrature output signals from here. And then X is the zero crossing point that we're not going to use in this one. The ELS itself requires a dif differential signal according to the manual. So instead of just A and B, it needs A and A inverse, B and B inverse. And the reason it needs those, so the inverse is basically one is high while the other is low. And the reason for having the, the pair like that is you can put it through a twisted pair cable and you get what's known as noise immunity. So it means that you can have a longer cable from here to the box uh, with less chance of noise interfering with the measurement of the rotation. Now, one of the things that I didn't order the first time from Rocketronics that I did order the second time is this circuit board here that can be soldered directly onto here, like so. Um, and it's a pretty tight fit because of this uh, metal piece here. But uh, when you solder it on like this, it takes those single inputs, the A and the B inputs, and turns them into A minus and A plus and B minus and B plus here. And that's done through this little chip here, which for those of you who are interested is uh, an XOR chip. And so what happens is for A, there are two XORs that they put A into. One of the XORs has, has the other lead attached to ground and the other one attached to high. And then the two outputs go through a resistor probably to uh, protect it against uh, shorts to the various uh, outputs. It's a really clever circuit. So I'm going to wire that up. And then what that will allow me to do is to just use a standard Ethernet cable from here to the back of the box. Before I do that, though, let me um, actually try out a different encoder that I have on the unit itself. This is the input for the spindle encoder, and you can see we have two choices. We can only use one of these. One is the Ethernet cable that I'm planning to use, and then this other is uh, screw terminals, which I'm using just for testing. You can see we have the 
the two different inputs, uh, A and B, as well as the invert, for the differential signals. And the manual did not make it clear. Well, actually, reading the manual, it sounded like I needed to have a differential signal all the time. But I figured I had this encoder that I showed last time, and it has the labeling on here of, of which is A and B. And I thought, okay, I'm just going to hook this up without the differential signal. I'm going to hook it up directly and see what happens because I'm curious. Okay, so I can't put this down flat because there's this power cord coming out the back. So I'm going to have to hold it. But uh, if I turn on the power, you can see that uh, it comes on. And if I start to turn this, uh, look right here at the U. This is basically telling us uh, the spindle rotations per minute using whatever the default uh, pulses per rotation is for the box. Um, what this is showing you though is that it is picking up the encoder input and if I try to turn it fairly consistently you can see that I get fairly consistent numbers. So that is telling me that um, I don't need the differential input. I'm still going to use it because it's going to give me better signal quality and more immunity to noise. I got the pulley from Misumi, and it's a beautiful looking pulley, so let me put it on, make sure I actually ordered the correct thing. And uh, that's easy to order the wrong thing, as you'll see in just a minute, but that fits beautifully. That's perfect. So I'm really happy with that part. Now, the part that I was alluding to, let me just tighten this. Yeah, that's, that's going to be perfect, is the, the belt. I made the same exact mistake that James Clow made by ordering a belt that is clearly too short. And what happened is I ordered, I thought I was ordering based on the number of teeth, but instead I'm guessing I was ordering based on the, uh, the diameter, well, the circumference, rather than the number of teeth. So I'm going to have to order new belts. But at least I've got the, the correct pulley, so uh, that's a good start. And one of the things I'm noticing here is uh, quite a bit of backlash. Oh, I know why. I need to tighten these uh, set screws. So let me go and uh, find the correct wrench and tighten this down. Okay, that certainly made it better. So now the only backlash is the backlash in the gear. And uh, so you know, one thing I'm noticing from this is that um, I certainly won't be able to use this for position uh, reading of the head because there's too much backlash in this. But in terms of reading RPM and doing screws, uh, it's always going to be turning in the same direction while I'm doing that, so it should be just fine. Uh, but if it isn't, uh, then I'll have to go back and uh, uh, do another mounting mechanism. So I'll give that, this a try at least. Last time I mentioned that I wanted to somehow connect this encoder to the pulley. So I ordered pulley with an 8mm shaft uh, or bore. And at the same time I ordered some 8mm bar, which you can see goes through the shaft. It doesn't go through all the way at the moment because there's a set screw in the way but I can feel that it will go through as soon as I loosen the set screw just fine. Now here it's a loose fit, but they have these different bushings that you can use that are different sizes, and they come in all these different sizes. The one that I want is, I believe, uh, this, this one here. One of these. I'll have to figure it out. Basically, I'm looking for the largest one, probably this one here. Um, which I believe is going to be the 8mm one. So this will allow me to attach the encoder to the shaft. And then what I'm planning to do is to use a pair of these roller bearings to take up the side load uh, from the, the pulley so that there's no side load on the encoder itself. And so you can see that these shafts go through the bearings just fine. So let me take you to the computer and I'll show you how all of this is going to fit together. After quite a bit of fooling around, this is the design I came up with. And the idea here is that the shaft right here is held in place by the screws on the pulley. And then the encoder is going to grab the shaft here 
and hold it basically in place against here. So that will constrain it between here and here. And then there's a bearing down here so that it's riding on a bearing up here and a bearing down there for strain relief against the pull in this direction. But after a while I realized that I could use a different design where I have the pulleys uh, constrained between two bearings and two blocks like this. So that way all the force is in between these two blocks and then there's very little force on this, just the rotational force. So this is the version I decided to go with because I have these nylon washers and so the idea is I have one nylon washer there and one down there to ensure that the force and the rotation friction is between the inner race of the bearing, this washer, and then the outer surface of the pulley, both here at the top as well as on the bottom. So, and this is what I decided to go ahead and print, and uh, let's try that out and see how it works. I'm going to do a test assembly of this. It's not going to be the final assembly because I'm not going to put in the sleeve that will lock this to the shaft. And I'm also going to want to cut the shaft down to length. But what I want to do is assemble it enough so that I can actually put it into the machine and try it out, see how it looks, and then I can measure the actual belt length that I need to finish this up. So the two bearings are uh, just a slight friction fit in the, the pre -D, 3D printed material. Uh, if I can get it in straight. So they're not going to go anywhere, but the way I've designed this, they would be held in place even if they were a loose fit. Okay, so we have those two in place. One of them is the top, and one of them is the bottom. I didn't think to label which is which, but I do know that the, uh, the screw on one side is slightly away. So if we look here, there's a what's supposed to be a gentle slope. It's actually pretty ragged from the 3D printing. And that goes this way. Now one of the things I did with this that I thought is interesting is I learned about these uh, square nuts. These are M3 nuts. Because they're square instead of hex, it means when I put them in here, they're not going to rotate uh, as easily as a hex nut would. So these are a great way to design things that are going to be 3D printed and attached to each other. So then I can just take the, the screws and screw them into the, uh, the nuts. So the, the assembly of this is really quite simple. Okay, now the pulley is designed so that there's one of these Teflon washers between the, the pulley and the bearing. And that's so that the pressure is going to be on the inner race because the outer race is fixed. So that means when the pulley goes on here with the shaft through it, like so. Oh yeah, I need to loosen uh, one of these. There we go. So what I can do is put this in here. Like so. And then I can uh, lock this in place with the uh, set screws. Okay, so this can move in and out, and it uh, looks like I I missed the uh, the washer, so I have to take this off. Okay, so that, now that will turn really smoothly and be up against a hard stop there. The other one fits on the same way. So I'll take another of these washers and then put it on top like so. And then this one goes down here and it captures that in place. So this can turn freely and it's held in place by these two. So I'll just take and put a couple of the uh, square washers in there. And the thing that I'm noticing is that um, this is binding a little bit, so I need to definitely open up the, the nut holes um, so that it, it doesn't uh, 
it's it's not really binding, but it's it's not as loose as I would like it to be. So that's something I can fix. The other thing I want to do is um, change the position of the shaft so that it's coming out this way. Yeah, what's happening with the, the two bearings is because the, the fit is... Yeah, I need to loosen these. It's definitely binding up a little bit. So I'll need to make some adjustments to the, uh, the 3D print. Um, but as it is right now, the, the shaft is held in place in between. And now what I can do is I've got the, the bottom piece, which is right here. And so this goes on like here with the encoder. Uh, let's see. So what I realized, I mean, the way I have this set up is this is going to go for the banjo. And then this attaches to the side, and then the connection is going to come out this way. So let me go ahead and get the two nuts in here. Oh, they go into the back. I forgot. Okay, so there's the assembly. As I say, it's going to be coming out this end uh, with the connector, the uh, differential uh, driver coming out this way. So now let's uh, take this to the uh, the lathe and you know see what the geometry looks like once once we actually put it into the lathe. I don't have the screw to hold this in place, um, but uh, that looks like it's going to work just fine. And uh, there's a little bit of wiggle room. I can tighten this, of course, but as soon as I put the screw in there with the T-nut on the back, it should hold it firmly in place. And then uh, all I need to do is, uh, there's a little bit of wiggle here, so I might need to beef things up a little bit, or maybe just fine. Um, I think I'll try it as it is first and uh, see how it goes. Lining up along here, I can see that uh, the belts are pretty much in, in line the way I expected them to, so that's a success. So I uh, took some string and wrapped it around these two just to get an approximate length. So what I'm going to do is for an arc, I had the cap in my mouth. So put a mark on those two pieces so that when I pull it out I can measure the length. This tells me I need a belt of uh, about 225 millimeters, so that's what I'm going to order next time. As you probably noticed, I am trying to give you my thought process and walk you through the steps to save you some time in your conversion to an electronic lead screw so that you can have a better idea of how to figure out how to mount things, uh, what pulleys to choose, uh, what belts to choose, how to measure things, that sort of thing. If this is too much detail, let me know. If it's the right amount of detail, let me know. Uh, if you have any other suggestions, complaints, observations, let me know. In other words, please comment below. In addition to that, uh, please subscribe if you haven't already. Uh, give me a thumbs up. And if you have already subscribed, ensure that you click the bell icon next to the subscribe button so that you'll be notified when I have new episodes. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.